Monty and welcome to Astronomy for Beginners. Um, today I'm going to do a several guides. Uh, obviously this is going to take some time to do because there's a lot to this guide. Now this guide is particularly important because there's a lot of um, forums and a lot of the other stuff you see on YouTube that don't actually highlight um, certain things about astral imaging or if you're taking photos from DSLR or CCD. Now what I'm trying to do is I'm going to show you a typical setup that I use that's going to work quite well most of the time. Obviously it's not guaranteed it's going to work 100% but when you're setting up an imaging rig and your typical setup for a, an astron you know, astronomical uh, session or an observing session, as I like to say. A lot of tips and hints that I that I like to share with you. That um, a lot of foot forums and a lot of YouTube uh, sites fail to uh, tell people about. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go give you a quick look around of all the stuff that I've got, and I'm going to highlight a few certain items that you could have or a few other hints and tips go along so that when you do set up um, you're not going to run into any problems. Uh, one thing I have, I have to say is even though I'm not actually observing or imaging um, I always do a, a dry run or a practice run. Now you can do this indoors and basically what you're doing is you're setting up your equipment is if you're doing an actual uh, an imaging or an observing session. Now, uh, it sounds really crazy, but what you're trying to do is you're actually practicing and you're training yourself up so that you know exactly where things go and all that, particularly in the imaging setup. The imaging setup is very temperamental and you have to get it right. Now, the reason why you practice is when you go out there in the field or whatever, more, more, yeah, you, you'll practice this, your, your, your dry run, and you'll know exactly where well, each bits go and all that. And plus, whilst you're doing this practice run, you know exactly that you are taking the right sort of equipment with you so you're not missing any items, and you're guaranteed that the equipment setup is running perfectly prior to you observing or imaging. So, what I'm going to do now, guys, is I'm going to show you a variety of equipment and a variety of attempts and tips all around my setup so that you guys will give you an idea to help you guys out there what exactly what, what, um, what you're looking for. Now, a picture paints a thousand words, believe it or not, and this film is ideally to show you how this, how my typical setup works for me. Uh, bear in mind, not everyone might, might agree with my setup, some people will disagree. But it works for me, and that's the key. You want to set up your equipment so it's right for you. All right. People have got different variants and versions and how they have their structures. But but please, like I say, this is only my setup. All right. So don't you know? Don't have to take this as if it's going to guarantee to work. But don't forget, talk about astral photography. You need to set it up properly as best you can so that you're not going to get any assholes in that and you're going to have great pictures and that's the key alright so we're going to go over at the back of my cellar and I'm going to show you the typical setup that I use ok I'm going to take you now around my typical setup right, and I'm going to go through highlights of all the equipment and all the uh, stuff that I'm going to show you that I use particularly ok alright now as you see it looks like one hell of a uh, project here, all right, and it is. But where it's how it's labelled for me, how it's set up for me, is I know it's making it easier for me, for particularly for imaging or for an observing session. So basically, I'm going to go to each part of equipment and describe to you what they are, and a few other bits, little tips that I found that makes it, you know, makes it work for me. Okay. So first off, I'm going to go off at this end. Now, believe it or not, these are bags that you can buy from Geo Optic. Right, Geo Optic. Now, they're a, I believe they're an Italian-made sort of brand. Now, they do series of bags, 
and they do in different sizes I mean this particular is a really good um, bag for putting your EQ5 mount and believe it or not you can actually put the tripod legs and the head all together in a wanna so you don't have to uh, mess about all you have to do is take the uh, the counterweight bar off and it slides right in there they're about 70 euros it sounds a lot of money but believe me these will protect your EQ mount from getting damaged and all that and they're really handy they, you know you can carry these all around with you uh, put them into the car and they're a good little investment another little tip and again Geo Optic again also do various other uh, bags I mean they do telescope bags as well so you can put your telescope tube in uh, in these certain bags but they also do a um, believe it or not a little counterweight now uh, you know obviously they get counterweights um, these little bags I mean I don't really I'm not a big fan of putting counterweights with your telescope equipment or EQ fire mounts or something like that Counterweights, I like to keep them separate because they're very heavy. And these particular, um, these counterweights weigh about five kilograms. So I'd really like to keep heavy items like this away from your equipment because you can, if you, especially if you transport it through the car, you don't want to damage the telescope or your cameras or your or your mounts as well. Now I, I always, ideally, I like to store them in this separate count, counterweight bag. Again, these are about 20 euros. Sounds a lot of money, but believe me, you can fit two um, counterweights, which will weigh about five kilograms. So that's so that's really around. I think it's around about 10 kilos or something like that. But what it does is it protects the counterweights as well, and also it, it as it stores in a nice tight pack. All right, it, you know, in a nice little handle, it, it makes it easier to handle as well. All right, and I like to keep my cart weights in this bag and it protects them and all that and it's waterproof. Okay, next little setup is right cases. Now, it depends on what you're going to get the cases for. Cases are really handy, particularly if uh, you've got a telescope or your cameras and all that. I like to keep them over um, because they just protect it. Now, usually, if you're low on the lucky ones, and you can get a, some telescopes that have a case built with it. Now, and that's why I usually house my uh, my 18 millimeter ED app Lunt, and uh, I usually this is usually for the case for that. But you can also use other cases like putting your guy scope setups. Now, the reason why I like different setup, different type of cases, is I don't like to keep too much items together say like the telescope and the, um, the camera and all that all together and because what it does is it makes it messy you might lose items you, you know it gets, takes some time setting up but as you can see what I've done is I arrange my cases in a way that I can keep each separate item and I know exactly what's stored in there so all my guy scopes are, high, or, are in here all right, so the guy scopes and the guy cameras are all in one box, all right, including the leads and the ST4 leads and the power leads for the guy camera setup. So I like to keep that in that case there, and then my telescope rig will kept, be kept here. Okay, again, bear in mind when you've got a um, telescope rig, I always like to keep the, the dust caps for the objective lens in here so I don't leave them lying about on the ground, or is I going to get grass in there or mud? And you don't want that in the uh, objective lens. So I always like to keep the dust caps and all that in here. It's quite a handy little piece to put in. And this is my imaging rig set up. Well, basically, this is all my cameras. And I've got my planetary camera here. I've got a few bits and pieces, uh, spare cables and, and, and power lines. Now, these boxes, believe it or not, uh, I've shown go through a few forums all right and these are just sandwich boxes but with a, a, a vacuum tight seal all right extremely handy especially if you're going to put your cameras in there all right i put my ccd cameras in these and uh, basically it, it stops moisture from getting in and you can put some um, uh, you can put some uh, a desiccant um, sort of uh, bags in there which are just like little sashes that you can put in there, discount sashes 
and that keeps the withdraws all the moisture and all that and it keeps it away from and all that really good little items they don't cost that much money and where it's all arranged it's all this case is big enough that I can fit three cameras in this box all right and uh, it keeps it protected away from moisture and it, it's got a very protective uh, case as well it's really handy I always like to keep as you see keep all my cases separate so I have a camera uh, case they have a telescope case a guide camera case and then I have like an EQ mount um, bag and my counterweight. So as you can see, it's all arranged in a certain way. My laptop is separate as well, so it's in this laptop bag. So I keep all my stuff in there. Um, moving on. Again, as I mentioned before, you probably might have seen this before, this little setup. This is basically a box that I made, believe it or not, out of scrap board. All right. Anyone can make one of these. All right. If you've got some DIY knowledge, go ahead and make yourself one of these eyepiece boxes seriously recommend you again because um believe it or not th these these this is protecting my investment because i've got a lot of eyepieces a lot of filters i keep all my maintenance kit here with my compass my blow brush um, all my other stuff like my electronic stuff like my dew heaters and my fans and all my uh, two inch eyepiece uh, collection here as well Again, I can, it's in a way that I can store everything here. It's accessible. It protects it against the elements. All right, when not in use, I can flop it down there. All right, but all my accessories that I use for visual work and, and, and also for due and maintenance for the telescopes is all kept in this one box. Again, I have my planning spheres here already labelled up. All right, and it basically keeps it, you know, if I want something, I just grab what I want. I'll grab this eyepiece use it on the telescope and then so forth again it's all in one setup it's all arranged in a certain way they all I always like to like have one box with certain things and it makes it easier now bear in mind that not everyone will agree that uh, my, of myself because it uses too much space especially if you've got a, a small car somewhere I mean if you had a small car yeah, you might be a bit pushed to try and push all this equipment but believe it or not this equipment that I have all, all here is I can actually get all this kit in my Mark IV Golf, all right, which is a, re it's a relatively small car, but you'd be surprised at how much kit is out here, all laid out, can actually fit in my Golf. So just to give you a heads up that it looks like a lot of kit, but believe me, it might, it might, be, a bit, um, might be a bit, you know, not much room in there, but once you fold down the, uh, the passenger seats at the back, You've got loads of room and you can actually fit a lot of equipment so you think that that's a lot of equipment here but it is but what you've got to think about it is you can get this all of this in, in in a golf put it that way right moving on right as you notice um this this bit this pit this part here is um my computer table now this is just a normal fold away table right and you can actually uh take off the uh, the legs and all that all right, with clips all right, you can take off the clips in there all right, and it just folds away nice and neatly and like nice little picnic table um, again when you're imaging highly recommend you getting uh, like a fishing uh, a fishing sort of chair right which basically folds away you know they're not that much, mo much money nowadays you can pick them up for about a tenner or something just for a cheap one you, know, you don't need uh, a lot of money it just folds up like that, you know, and you've got your little holders there for you because you can put your beer in there when you're going to chill out and all that. And you just it's nice and comfortable because when you're imaging, you're going to need something to sit on, all right? Because if you're focused on the computer screen, you're going to need this for some time to try and uh, so it works for you, okay? So I always have like a little computer, you know, computer chair that I can sit and I'm comfortably. So once I'm using the, 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 the also the laptop. I can actually, uh, I can actually sit there and relax and start me an imaging setup. Right, moving on. Right, have you noticed here is 
this part here is basically where I keep my uh, my laptop in there. Basically, it's only a it's only a small netbook, but it does run the guide camera software and the imaging software. All right, and it works really well, believe it or not. It's just an, an Asus. Um, I think it's an Asus laptop or netbook. It's only about, um, it's only a 1.6 gigahertz sort of little laptop, but basically it runs, um, runs quite well. Not a, a great um, imaging processing laptop, but it's ideally suited for capturing more than anything. I capture my images and I also go with this, and it works really well. Again, it has been up, upgraded to uh, 2 gig of RAM so it runs just that little bit better all right worth investment now you can get some of these netbooks now i think they're much more powerful than these now but for 200 pounds for a laptop you just can't go wrong i mean this this is only cost me 200 quid and it runs perfectly and it runs the software everything brilliantly all right and that's all you need really you don't need a, a, an expensive laptop all right 1.6 gigahertz with 2 gig of ram and it runs perfectly it's a, it's a dual processor all right but you can get some decent cheap laptops that can run just as efficient now have you noticed the actual laptop is um, is actually uh, housed in this little basket now you can use reason why it's housed in this basket is that it keeps the moisture away from the laptop you don't want to get moisture in the laptop or is your software is not going to run very well all right so I basically got this fold away basket and this just folds away now I've created I put a, a sheet of um, like a you know a piece of cloth around here or a, or a towel anything to wrap it round to stop moisture from getting into the laptop and what that does is it makes a nice little shield away from stray light and also protects it from protects the laptop from the elements it all folds away all right, nice little setup there, and it protects it. Right, bear in mind, I put the the sheeting underneath the laptop, so moisture doesn't get underneath from as well. But it stops, prevents dew, and and all moisture trying to get into the laptop and, and cause havoc with your software and your your imaging. Right, uh, I've noticed where it's all slotted. I like this because you can actually feed your cables through here neatly. All right, and it's and it's more secure, so it runs all your, um, your, your your all your cables in there, USB cables. Also, at this little device here. Now this is a um, basically a Perspex red plastic. Uh, that's all it is, and you can buy these from a lot of good astronomical uh, shops like Rubber Valley Optics or First Light Optics. And they sell them for a reasonable price. Now they're probably about 10 to 20 pounds. But what they do is, is like I said before, using red light torch, this is, does exactly the same. Basically, it covers against over the the laptop screen. And what that does is, it will protect your uh, night vision. All right, because night vision is very important for astronomy. So and that's what it does. But bear in mind, you need to, if you order one. All right, is to ask a um, ask the uh, or the retailer to ask them the what size of netbook it is. Usually, a lot of the online um, internet f um, shops out there they will provide you a click box to see what what type of screen of your laptop is. And this was here to just to fit a small 10-inch laptop. Works really well. Good investment. The good thing about this one, I mean, this is a relatively uh, expensive one. All right, and um, this doesn't scratch that well, you know, easily. So it's quite a good one. I've had it for about two years, you know, and uh, seriously, good little buy of that. All right, and it, it works perfectly. Now, again, as I said before, you don't have to uh, you buy it. You can actually get some sheeting that you can actually tape over and get something similar out. They're all cheaper alternatives, but as long as it Filters the light and protects your night vision, that's all I want. Also, as I mentioned before, I always have a pair of binoculars, like I mentioned in my last, uh, last guide on binoculars. I always have them, they're always handy, especially if you've seen something interesting in the sky and you want to look at it. Always carry a pair of binoculars. Right, now we're going to go across, as you see here, all right, 
this 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 setup here of my main imaging rig. Now this is just the my 80 millimeter EDA Apple uh, refractor, and it has my good old QHY 8L CCD. Again, it's powered with a finder finder scope with the, the guide cam which is a QHY5 alright now this looks like spaghetti junction here alright and it does but the way I've laid the way I've laid it out basically I've kept all my wires and cables cable tied and secured in a way that it's where it's all held in one place now you don't want wires too much wires everywhere because you're going to run the risk of uh, the cables getting entangled and then as you're um, moving the telescope it's getting trapped and you don't want entanglement or you can trip over them because what that does is if you start tripping over wires and all that you're going to lose your pole alignment and then you're going to back to square one hand to do all the whole entire setup again you know so what you're going to do is you have to rearrange now this is this is the important bit is I always do the gyro so that I know where the cables are where I want to position them all right and it's very very important now you notice here I have three batteries that run this rig believe it or not I mean the one's a 40 amp uh, battery that runs the CCD. Uh, the other one runs the um, the telescope mount itself, and then the middle one runs the dual heaters. Now, dual heater. Now, this is this is this setup here is set up to the extreme. This setup is basically run as it's all secured. It runs perfectly. I won't have any problems with balancing. I won't have problems with dewing up. I know everything on there is an extreme setup this is the most you're gonna get now bear in mind it's from night to night Mo most people will have dew heaters all right you can use dew heat uh, shields but true about dew shields is they'll stop the dew for a certain amount but at time to time if it's a really dewy night that dew will form up on the lenses and then what that does is it ruins your in imaging uh, train and basically it will ruin the image you're trying to take and it will affect the guide scope as well the tracking and the guide will also go to mess because this is the reason why I prefer to use dew bands all right dew heaters and basically just wrap around the telescope tube all right and they're run off by a lead and they go into one of these now this is a dew zapper box and they basically connect into this dew zapper box and then they run off through the the main battery here all right these will fight off you all night long guaranteed and you're not going to chew them up i always set this up always because you do never know that from night to night is that you never know when dew is up or not all right it just i've noticed that in the mo early hours in the morning the dew is at the worst point now um, bear in mind is that I always fit them all the time because the reason that is once you set it up, it only takes five minutes to set this up for for the dew bands and all that, and it's worth it in the long run. Now it does cost a bit of money, you know, for a dew heater and dew bands, but that's the that's the thing about astronomy is if you want to do some decent imaging and you want a good imaging train, then save up the money, save up the cash if you've got the, if the budget allows, that is, and let it. Um, let it for uh, for, you, for yourself you know just save up bit by bit or you're not going to guarantee you're going to get everything but at least when you've got the equipment you've got it and it works for you okay right we have where wired my wires especially on the dew heaters right particularly I've wrapped them around now I've wrapped it around in a certain way that it's not going to get entangled with the telescope and the reason why if I undo these clutches here okay now you see here that all the cables believe it or not it looks like a mess but they don't actually um, get knotted they don't actually get twisted all right they get twisted at a certain point but what i've done i've raised the cables in a certain way 
that they're not going to get entangled and what I've done is basically uh, you can use little bits like this like the quarter inch for the camera adapter for example if you've got some of these on your telescope you can wrap the cables around that all right secures it all right and now see this is what I've done here now at this setup here I've arranged the cables with like uh, really velcro uh, velcro pads here all right and you stick on the scope and there's a velcro lining here all right basically that secures the main wiring loom to the CCD and the obviously the guide camera and I've laid, I've where I've, where I've put it together is that as well as keeping the cables tidy nice and you know tidy and not getting and not getting tangled it also believe it or not this actually keeps the weight off the CCD right the CCD cable this loom here is quite heavy now what that does is it will affect the tracking or the balancing of the scope or and you'll create um, errors as well in the drive so you want to try and do it so you're going to prevent less of the cables dragging the scope or the, the CCD down also to, to highlight something is if you take a look at the uh, the CCD itself now not all CCDs will have this problem but on the QHYAL this is a particular big problem now these bits here these port cables they have a problem of uh, coming loose or coming off all right they're not great they're not that strong um, power cables all right this is the main power lead and that's the the main cable to the computer now they have a habit of just coming off because they are breaking the actual uh, ports themselves so what I do you can actually get more some of these velcro like a, a strap and basically it wraps around the cable and basically keeps the weight off the cable ports so you're not going to damage the, the ports right really little handy sort of thing quick little setup and you just just velcros around there you can buy them for about two maybe three pounds for a, a couple of these all right well worth the well worth the money and see and protect your investment as well simple little device all right as i remember all the cables now particularly on the ccd itself the actual loom itself is is surrounded by this this cable here this is like this is a 10 mil thick um like cable tidy stuff and it basically wraps around um, the it's actually got wraps around two wires now a lot of ccds might have three um, wire space so you need the power cable uh, or the USB or maybe the guide port or the pa actual um, the actual sort of dew heater or something like that so ideally what I've done is I made a loom out of this and it just wraps around all right and it takes a while to feed it around the entire cable but it's best to get yourself some of the cost about three or four pounds for I think it's about two or three meters or so all right and it just wraps around this cable and what also what this does is it protects the the cables as well because a lot of cables when you set up is it'll, it protects it especially if it's on the ground or something uh, you trod on it or something you're going to knack your cables because it's slightly armoured it, it protects it right and stops them from getting damaged really good investment also what I've done is as you can see on my uh, this, this setup is I've arranged it in a certain way that I have my control box there for my hand controller and my auto guider port and I've, and I've set my uh, dual heater again all I've done with all these I've, I've secured it with this like velcro now you need to get some really strong velcro pads some that you can get that holds around about a kilogram or something like that as strong as that but uh, you see I've, 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 I've got it all laid out it's in, it's in such a way that it keeps the stuff you, know, you don't want them on the ground especially on the wet damp floors and basically I've kept them in a way that stops damp and mud getting in there and starts damaging your equipment and it's all set up so you can get easy access as well so that's where I've arranged it again if you look underneath here all my cable looms here are all secured including the main power box down here 
all right for the ccd it's all kept off the ground all right so it's not going to be in contact with moisture or and whatever all right and it also all the wires all the main wires are all in one place with the batteries all right it's whole whole secured in one place because what i've done is in a certain way is i kept most of the wires all together in one place the only wires that i have left is basically the main cable for this CCD, all right, and then I have the, the actual guide camera um, lead as well, and I fed it again, still off the ground. All right, you bear in mind, I mean, some cables you can leave them on the ground, as long as you, they are all tied, secured away in a certain format, that you're not going to trip over them. Because believe me, if you start tripping over any of these cables. You could ruin your imaging train straight away. You will have no guiding. Your your image will be ruined totally, and you can damage your equipment as well. And it's a process. So I've done it in a certain way that you're not going to trip over it because believe me, you don't want to ruin your equipment, especially if you've paid a lot of money. So this is the reason why I've done dry runs. Dry runs are very important because this is what it does. You know, you're setting it up, you're practicing, you're learning how your kit gets, gets assembled, and that's really important. Right, what else have I uncovered? Right, as I mentioned before, is that my batteries a lot of people are a bit a bit curious why I've got three batteries now the main problem is yes I have a battery that's a 40 amp battery and that could run anything really but the main problem is it is a 12 volt battery but the, the, the main problem is if you can yeah you can have a high power battery but still runs at 12 volts now if you run your telescope mount and your CCD camera and your dual heaters in one battery what are you going to introduce is yes it's running 12 volts but the CCD believe it or not uses a lot of power now the C8QHY8L runs around about 4 to 5 amps per hour All right, so you need a heavy duty battery to get it run all night this battery runs it for about 2 maybe 3 nights pushing it okay and it, I have just purely just the CCD running through this battery here right again reason why you run separate things why I run separate ones for each one is because you don't want to introduce power loop or ground loop or whatever it is you call it basically if you start putting too much kit along uh, one battery in particular uh, your equipment's not going to run 100% all right there are certain uh, instances where if there's a slight drop in voltage where the battery is slowly discharging or that it's going to cause problems with your uh, your tracking on the mount it might introduce uh, interference of the CCD image itself which you start getting uh, a slight color of red or green banding on the image trip you know, on the actual image of the picture you're taking and you don't want that because thing is when you're processing you can't process that out so you need to do it so that you don't have too much stuff running on one battery that's why I have three batteries now you don't have to have three batteries all right uh, you can get away with it but this is set up in a way for the extreme this is the extreme possibilities this rig itself will run sufficiently all night without any problems that's where I've arranged it now most of I mean ideally if you haven't got dual heaters then you only need I prefer to just use two batteries so that you can have the, the, the 17 amp power amp tank for example run the mount and then get yourself if you're running a Q, you know, a QHY ATEL or any CCD uh, cameras is get yourself a heavy duty battery no less than 20 amps per hour the more the merrier uh, this 40 amp um, battery is actually quite uh, can be handled quite easily it's, it's, it's a bit heavy 
but you can carry it by hand, all right, with one hand. Now, uh, obviously, this is um, the battery that's used in this is actually a deep cycle battery. It's not actually a car battery as such. It is, but this this setup here is um, is basically um, it's a deep cycle battery. Now, a lot of uh, if you go to a lot of yachting companies or um, or caravan companies, you can buy deep cycle batteries, right? That you can use for leisure. You call them leisure batteries, but you can buy them from a lot of good caravan or travel shops, or your yachting or sailing uh, uh, companies as well. That will invest on these um, these um, leisure batteries. They call them. Also, this is housed in a uh, this is a battery power sensor. Basically. This will protect the battery from the elements. The battery is stored in there and it's wired up. It has ports that you can actually uh, charge it up with a, uh, a car charger battery. So you can charge it up. It also has two ports at either side. It, it even has um, this little, it has like circuit breakers in case it runs too much uh, power. And it also has a, uh, a test button which you can test the status of the battery, the condition of the battery. Really little handy feature. Again, the, the, this, this, uh, power, uh, this battery power center box is about, costs around about 40 to 60 pounds. You can get them cheaper, all right? But this one will house um, some as large as a 60 amp uh, battery. All right, so the, they're pretty easy to set up, you know, and they're quite durable and they protect the battery no end. The good thing about these, I like these bits because you can charge the battery without having to take the battery out. So if the battery does explode or something like that, or something's gone wrong, all right, this 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 cover will protect from that from happening. It's a really good, handy little device. But again, I like you to use batteries. I don't like using the mains. I mean, you can use a um, you can use a, a power adapter that can run off through your car have the engine to run it up through this power adapter and, and like a power inverter and run it off through there but I prefer to use batteries because they're much easier they're safer to use something goes wrong at least the battery you know, will, will, you know, will die but luckily you won't you know you're not in the risk of getting electrical shocks or something like that also uh, I thought the that does run on an AC inverter I use an AC inverter for which I connect to my car um, but believe it or not, the reason why I also got the, the netbook, because it's got a small processor, what that does is, I mean, this runs off for about 11 hours. So that's the reason why I got the netbooks. You know, try and get a netbook that has got a really good uh, battery life. This one has. This will run for 11 hours, not problems. You can get some will run even uh, longer. Alright, believe it or not, despite all the, the guiding and the imaging software that I'm going to use to capture the images and guide, this will run for 11 hours non-stop. Alright, it's a brilliant little laptop, alright? So, basically, I just use the, the battery power to run off that. But if I'm in serious circumstances where the battery is about to uh, die on me, I connect it up with the power lead into the, the car uh, power inverter. All right, and it runs fantastic. Um, okay, uh, right. This is another thing I've noticed. Now, because uh, where I've designed this this rig, I designed it so that my imaging rig is as further away from me as possible when I'm uh, imaging from my laptop. The reason why is I don't want to go too close to it in a way that. The, you know, I'm going to start upsetting the, the imaging train. If I start nudging the tri tripod leg or a trip over summit, I'm going to totally ruin the pole alignment and everything else. So this is the reason why I've done this in a certain way that that my imaging rig is away from me as possible. Now, a lot of guys will disagree with me from there, but believe it or not, this rig is in, in a certain way that I do not actually have to physically look at the eyepiece at all. I do not need to look at the eyepiece. The only time that I'll need to use this to touch anything is probably the focus wheel. All right. Um, again, 
uh, where my set up design, I mean, yeah, you always have to focus the image when you're taking the image. Um, on mine, I'm looking one of the fortunate ones that have a refractor that has this, this uh, focus tube that has numbers on. Now, believe it or not, I actually remembered my numbers. It's all in centimetres along here, and I can actually get my exact focus once of 5.5 for this imaging tray, all right, and it's perfectly focused. And all I do is just lock it off at the bottom of here of this here and then that's it I get perfect focus but but 9 out of 10 is not 100% all the, it's not 100% accurate all the time but it gets me close as damn it and all I do is do a fine tune on the one on the 10 to 1 uh, fine tune here on the focuser that's the only time I actually touch my telescope uh, when I need to get the image. Now for the setup that's different. You're obviously going to start touching the mount and all that for polar alignment. So you're going to start adjusting the screws and then starting the balance and all that. That's the, uh, the only time that I will touch the telescope. Um, also, um, once I'm imaging, that's it. I do not have to, once I've got it polar aligned, I've aligned two stars. Basically the alignment, the star alignment I always use is um, I go straight to my laptop and I use the actual the camera CCD camera all right as my tray as my imaging tray all right the only difference that I uh, will probably have to use is before I uh, start imaging I will take this off uh, the 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 guy scope off and I'll put me red dot finder in place and what I do is I do my basic star alignment first I line up the two star alignments. All right. Once it's in the laptop on the screen through the CCD, all right. I will use that from there, all right, and then I line up to the next star. Hopefully that will sort it out. Bear in mind, um, if pole alignment is not as accurate, I use a I do a re pole alignment which I use on the handset. Uh, again, have you noticed that I've rearranged my handset in certain way? I've extended the cable. Now you can buy these cables. This is basically a telephone line of, I believe it's an eight pin uh, tele, you know, telephone uh, connection. Basically there's an adapter that clips onto the, the actual handset cable itself. And then this, this, this uh, cable is actually, if I can read this out, is a, it's a Cat 5E. And it's a, uh, it's basically, uh, it's a it's a giga gigabit Ethernet cable. Now I think it's a I think it's a, a, a 45 is it J45 cable, basically to fit eight pin. And basically what that does is it allows me to I mean I literally can extend the cable. Okay, I mean, I'm a literally a good two maybe three foot away. All right, and I'm totally away from the the, the actual imaging rig, and again it stops me getting entangled up I can also believe it or not I've put some velcro pads again that I can actually stick see it here onto the table so basically I can stick this on the table and I can start operating in the star alignment if I can do the star alignment on here or move the telescope so that I can uh, readjust All right, and I can just press on the keyboard and then look at the laptop line it up to the star and bingo I'm doing my star alignment from just sitting on my table, or sitting on my table here, using the laptop and using the handset. Now, a lot of guys will use a, uh, a device called EQ Mod. Now, uh, to be honest with you, a lot, I've had a lot of people that say that yeah, it runs quite well with EQ Mod and like. To be honest with you, um, I always like to prefer the, the hand control. To be honest with you, it seems to work really well for me. But most people are using a, a device called EQ Mod. But again. You still need to buy a um, the adapter kit for it, which costs money. But believe it or not, this cable is only a quick flow effect. Just extend that cable a little bit, all right? Just a good two foot, maybe three foot away at the most. Don't extend it too much. But this is just long enough, and it runs sufficiently. And I can stick this, and I'm totally, completely away from the imaging tray. All right, I'll leave that imaging rig alone. As you, as you can see, it's, it's arranged in a certain, certain way that I'm not going to affect it, okay? 
so basically this 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 rig will run up all night all night long and take great images of pictures of desaws and all that as you know and you can see you can see the how uh, how uh, you know how 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 well the range is set up? It's it it works for me. Now others you might have you might disagree with my setup, but I'm just helping out you know as much as I can. There might be some stuff that you might not know of. Right. Well, forgot to mention is because of the loom being too heavy, you're going to affect the balance of the scope and the tracking and the guiding and the image itself. Um, you can get these velcro clips from a lot of DI workshops and I basically wrap that round and it sticks on the base of the, of the EQ mount head. Um, you can get these clips here, you can get them on DIY shops, they're like a cable um, tidy that you can actually stick onto walls, alright, uh, stick onto walls and basically it's kept all my stuff and I can actually rotate the entire setup and the setup one, even to the extreme, all right, it's not going to get entangled. It's not going to restrict the movement. All right, I've done it in a certain way that it's not going to upset the drivetrain. It's not going to uh, ruin, you know, ruin the tracking or that. It's in the way that it's totally, totally free from loose cables and all that. Uh, the only thing I am a bit disappointed with the Q5. Now is these cables for the RA and the and the decanation drives. Unfortunately, there is no other way you can actually secure them. Now, um, I, I try to secure these, and to be honest with you, if you secure them, it then starts restricting the the movement of the drive and all that. So that's the only bad flaw about it. Now the EQ6 or the EQ uh, HEU EQ5 mounts don't have this problem. Um, their, their drives are all encased, the wick cables and the wiring is all encased in the mount itself. Also, another tip is, um, you notice that the, the, the actual telescope uh, imaging rig is actually perfectly balanced in a way. Now, as I mentioned before, and uh, I'm sure a lot of forums have mentioned this, is if you put your telescope too perfectly, uh, perfectly balanced, you're going to introduce, uh, as I mentioned before in my last guide, is you're going to introduce a um, you're going to introduce V shapes or faults in your tracking. Now I've also refurbed this mount. All right, all the gears have been re-greased, cleaned up, readjusted, and all that on the drives and all that. But however, if you're still getting V shape, uh, shapes on your drive or the tracking, all right. 9 out of 10, it's more likely that your count weight just needs to be uh, slightly adjusted in a way. So basically you slacken the, uh, the counter weight in a way so that you're going to get, you see that here? Alright, you're basically throwing your, uh, your just, you know, balance slightly. And what you're doing is as you lock it in place and it's tracking and it's taking images, that's going to put permanent pressure onto your gear drives okay so what you're doing is you've you've thrown the balance slightly but you're going to put permanent positive gear drive and it basically stops the gears from slopping or free playing up as the basically as the the driving gear turns uh, the driven gear it's not going to flush rate and basically cause these v-shaped patterns now i believe that if you're the gear, the, the count weight has to be adjusted in a certain way. Now, if your telescope is pointing to the east side, so if it's at the east side of the sky, okay, so your telescope's pointing eastward, you need to adjust the, the count weight up so that if I lift that up slightly, and it's a bit difficult trying to do this with one hand, but. Uh, You basically want the t you want the scope to like basically just like um, tilt downwards like so. Basically, that's providing drive. If the telescope's going this way, pointing uh, westwards, all right, you want to position that uh, counterway downwards so that as it's tracking, all right, well that's too much, 
All right, so I'll, I'll just it up. No, too much still. Again, what you see now is see now. See, I've still got yeah. So I've just it in a way so that it's it's put in permanent drive and stops the uh, the gears from fluctuating, all right, or, or moving about. It's causing these weird V shapes. Now, that's usually what's going to eliminate most of the problems there. But like you say, um, that's a little tip that I've noticed. And if you still, if you've done the, you followed my guide and you followed, and you've done the refurb on the EQ5 mount and you're still getting that, it's probably more than likely to be your counterweights as well. Okay, so, a little tip on there. But again, I'll rewind it in a certain way, but, um, Right. What's going to go off now is that as I'm imaging, all right, and once I've got everything set up and I've got auto guiding and I'm auto guiding, and once I've got auto guided and the telescope's got the image of what I want to view or obviously imaging, I basically take the captures and I set the different exposure times and frames and all that, and I just leave it alone, all right, leave it alone. Once it's all running and all that and running fine, all right. Just leave it alone and let it do its own thing. Now, bear in mind, when you're imaging on that, it's basically, you're not doing much then after that. Once you've got everything set up in, in a certain way, that um, you're going to spend hours doing nothing. So what I have done is, I, if I'm imaging, and the imaging is working fine, and it's working 100%, and I'm getting great images, leave it alone just let it do its own thing now if you've got a mono ccd you might need to invest on um filters and filter wheels now but i'm not going to go too much in depth for that i don't want to lose your guys track of it if you've if you're a mono if you've got a mono ccd you're probably aware of it all right that's the only time you're going to be busy when you've got a mono is you're going to change the the filters over for the filter wheel and so forth for the guys who got the uh, the colour CCDs, you're the lucky ones. Once this is running and you're getting images, you just leave it alone. And then what I do is I always bring I always like to bring a second scope. And then this is this second scope is basically what I use for uh, basically visual work. I, know, I like to do a bit stargazing, all right, whilst I'm imaging, and it passes on the time. You don't need to worry about the imaging train. All right, and I just take a good old, you know, get a good second second scope. Right, I've got the the Skywatcher 127 Max 12. And it's an awesome little visual scope. It does everything for me. Again, have you noticed one thing? I've got a a, a do I've got a do uh, heater and uh, an obviously shield that also will stop it from doing up because apparently the Max 12 or any type of these telescopes have a habit of doing up big time so I have this and this is again it's all it's all set up for visual use okay and I've got my little scene scan handset and all that again I do not like to use um, uh, normal batteries that you can get from the shops and all that don't like using them because they're not very sufficient they don't run really well I like to prefer to get a good power cable all right, and running off a good power tank or power station you can get them from Alfred or even astronomical telescope shops uh, that will sell these okay good power tanks and this this is a, just a 7 amp per hour but this runs the this telescope for hours and hours on end all right and I can just enjoy myself watching uh, the the planets and the DSOs and all that or the moon whatever and I always, I always have a second, uh, second telescope that I use whilst I'm imaging. I'm occupied because, believe me, you don't want to stand on this computer screen and look at the screen uh, all night. So, 
see with the, with this lap with this setup is that uh, you don't want to spend too much right the first uh, you want to start looking at the, the laptop now and again so that you you your also your imaging is okay and there's no drifting and everything's running fine but I thought I'd just show my my typical setup how I run it or how my setups are arranged all right I'm sure that this is probably give you some lot of hints and tips for your guys all right and uh, I hope hope this that it, it's, it's it's taught you uh, a lot of good uh, advice here all right uh, and um but uh, like you say um my next my next guide is basically I'm going to run I mean this is just a giant dry run but this basically is that sort of setup you will do even when you start up your know, proper session all right but well my next guide is basically going to run off the computer software how to open up uh, your capture software and your auto guiding software using PhD guiding and using uh, EasyCap which is the main software for the QHY ATL CCD uh, camera and I'm basically going to run it off and I'm going to do a detailed uh, uh, tutorial on this so that how, how I will set my computer and as if I'm doing an imaging uh, session so I'm, I'm hope that this is you've learned a lot from this uh, tutorial guys alright and just wait out for my next guide so thanks again for watching and uh, clear skies Hi everyone, I'm Martin and welcome to Astronomy for Beginners and today I'm going to do a little guide on the, the setup of my netbook and uh, basically what I'm trying to demonstrate is the programs that I use for astral imaging. Now the thing is before you um, download any of these um, softwares it's a good idea that any cameras or CCDs that you, you're going to use, make sure you download the actual drivers for them. Usually the drivers usually come with the cameras anyway, but make sure you get all your drivers and the ESCOM drivers, which you can get, which is usually provided with the CCD, that's built into also downloaders and and uh, installed into your laptop before you start downloading some of these programs here. Now, as you see, I've got a not many uh, des desktops here, um, and basically what I'm trying to do is try to save as much memory as I can, because especially if you've got PhD guiding, you're running that, and you're running EasyCap at the same time. So I'm running two programs at once with this small netbook that I use. Believe it or not, it runs really well, and uh, I'm just going to show you the variety of programs that I have. At the moment, when I set up the telescope and it's polar line, before I polar lining, I have to reset the, the, uh, the, the polar alignment reticle. Now, as I mentioned before, about um, your reticle has to be set to a certain way as as, as when you set it, is once you align it to North Star, that reticle is in a certain position. Now that certain position, as you can get, if you download Polar Finder, basic, basically it's a quick app that you can download. You just type in Polar Finder and you'll find it. And it gives you this up-to-date uh, program, all right, and it pops up like this. Basically, um, what this program does it will show you the actual decal. Now this is the decal here that you try to align up. Now you have to set that decal because what you're doing is uh, that decal has to be set because what happens that the North Star moves actually rotates it around about a, a one degree. Now that one degree will make a hell of a difference of your tracking and your go to capability. Just that one degree out will affect your pole alignment in a big way. So this is the reason why we set our decal. Now this is the decal here 
And what you do is now you've got um, you've got like a pre-peak time, you've got next peak times. They are the timings that are set for when they're going to change over and the decal and where Polaris is going to move next, which is basically the transit of when Polaris position is going to be next. Now, obviously go off by these, the time from and the time when it's going to change. All right, it varies on where you are in the world. Now, this is the longitude, which is basically um, your degrees, minutes, and, and whatever. And obviously, if you're in the east ends or the west, and for me, my coordinates is uh, usually you can find your longitude through Google Maps. So basically, whatever observing site you're at, um, you can get the information through Google Maps, point where you are, and it should give you the, the longitude and latitude of where you are in the world. But basically, this is just asking for your longitude. For me, my longitude is, is this. Now, you have to adjust these dials in a way that uh, it will give you the uh, exact coordinates. Okay? So, you, you adjust these uh, little knobs. They're a bit, they're the only thing about the program is they're a bit fiddly. Okay? I'm trying to get it to the exact longitude I'm at at the moment. And uh, it, is, it takes a bit of a time to adjust because you can readjust it all the way up there. Alright, so I'm trying to adjust my longitude where I'm set. Alright, it's not easy. <laughs> but I will get there. That's the only trouble. I mean, you can get near his damn it. Okay. And right. That's sort of my longitude there. Basically, what happens there, it sets your Polaris at that rescue there. That center rescue here is basically where the Polaris is set. Now, obviously, as you just did latitude and all that, that rescue rotates all the way around, okay? Now, you don't need to bother with this dial here, right? This is mainly for people that's got um, Takahashi telescopes where the polar alignment scope is different. But it works the same sort of principle as your Skywatcher. Your Skywatcher is that's the one to go for. And I actually go for your Celestron as well. Celestrons also share the same reticle. Once you set that, basically what you do is you then go over to your equatorial mount and then you re you readjust your polar scope, rotate the basically loosen the uh, right tension axis and you rotate it round so the rescue matches with as you are on this app and then once that is done that is your uh, rescue set then when you do what you didn't do is now usually when you set the rescue is don't put the telescope tube and don't put the equipment on there because what you find that if you put all the stuff in there and then you try and line it up your rescue might be a way out and you have to literally tilt the telescope virtually almost upside down, so you can't physically do it. So you have to do it. We have, you know, don't put the items on the equipment on it. Just get the the pole alignment as much as you can without all the equipment on there. And then once you've got it lined up, you move the you move your altimeter off and altitude knobs adjusted, so you get in line with the circle. So you get your Polaris. Um, start in the middle of that circle. Once you've done, that is now set to um, to the, the rest is now set to uh, the, obviously the North Star or Polaris. Alright, and that's you done. Then just rotate it round just to make sure that it's not uh, gone out of alignment. Through, uh, but that should have been sorted out anyway. Okay. Once you've got it set up there, you basically just cancel off that because there's no need to have it open because you're just going to use memory um, unless you've got a, a powerful um, laptop or computer. Right. Then I have two programs that I use most of the time. Now I use Stellarium as a little planisphere, uh, uh, like a planisphere program that allows me if I want to look at objects and I've got. Because of the laptop, I don't usually have the internet in my location. But what I also could do is, you know, I usually um, basically I'll open up these two main programs there, which is PhD Guiding and EasyCap. Now, EasyCap is a QHY 
CCD program. Now, it just depends on what CCD program or what CC camera you have. Um, for most um, of the cameras you buy uh, from a lot of the companies, you usually get the issue software. Now, a lot of people like to use Nebiosity, they like to use Sharkart, they like to use other things. For me, I always find um, it's best to use the, the, the software designed for the camera. Now, I use EasyCab, which is a basic program, and, I, and it works for me. And I, I'm a big, big believer in if you're going to use stuff, use it for the camera it's designed for. For me, I use EasyCab. Now, a lot of people might disagree with me here, but for me, it works for me. And what I do is I basically click on these, once I've downloaded it and I've got EasyCal, I basically pop up this, this program here. And then this is my um, imagery. Basically, I've got um, a series of stuff here. All right, this focus area is my view here. I basically, I, um, I go through a series of things. Basically, I scan the camera and I find my camera first. All right, it's quite a, an easy program. All right, what I do with this is um, I will explain it later on when I'm properly running. All right, when I'm probably doing a proper session, because basically I set my camera, and what I do is I, I set my camera temperature control and I set the other stuff first before I do anything. So basically, I set the temperature, all right, auto control and all that, and then I then I, I do like uh, set me planner. So basically, I, I put a file name, create a folder, and then I do different size exposures like binning, exposure times, and then repeat how many frames and that. And I basically, as I drag it across, I, I start and I just basically collect the data. It's that easy. Um, and then basically I'm running. But for the time being, I'm not collecting data. I'm not actually imaging. But what I do is. I go to preview and it opens up. Right, we're on preview, okay. And basically this area here, right, is basically my view of what I'm looking at. I'll maximize that so you can see what uh, I'm doing. So what I do is I mean all the settings I usually just leave alone. Alright, I just lay set once the camera goes to the temperature that I set, basically I set the temperature and I adjust the gauge here and there'll be a gauge there which is I usually select the auto control and I, I cool it down. The reason why you cool the CCD camera is to eliminate noise. Alright? And you need to get a camera cooled down to a certain degree so that you get the no hot pixels and that. Alright? Um obviously it's a pretty basic camera. But because I haven't got no camera running, what will happen is once I'm on preview, I click on preview and I basically um, click um, activate. And what it does is it'll give you a preview image of the of the sky, and basically you'll see stars and all that. Now, if you don't see any stars, you usually have to focus the image, so you have to adjust the telescope focus. And then as soon as you get the stars appear on screen, it might be time delayed. You set an exposure, let the exposure run. And then, once you sort of see the focus, what I do is, I then line up, um, basically I do my two star alignment, and basically what I do with two star alignment is I, I set up my red dot finder, and then I basically um, do the two star alignment on my EQ, uh, on the EQ mount, and from there, once I get a star lined up from the red dot finder, in theory it should be in view of the camera on the CCD uh, chip and you'll see stars and all that and usually the brightest stars you can't mistake them you'll see them and then basically what I do is I, I set up uh, on here I set up on the preview screen because I can't activate it I set up a like a, a crosshair and the crosshair appears here okay and then I line the, the telescope adjust the telescope drives and move the, the drives so that the, the center star is in the middle Okay, once it's in the middle, I then tap enter and then move on to the next star. And the next star will do exactly the same process. Line it up with the red dot finder and then line it up to the CCD. And that's basically my two star alignment. Hopefully the best that I'm properly polar, polar aligned and my stars are now tracking and then at the same point. Alright, 
that's the reason why I never actually use an eyepiece for imaging at all. I just basically use my camera as an eyepiece. So get into the habit of into that. And basically, once I've done that, I usually go to focus here, and I and basically I do a, like a preview image. I stop the image, and then I, I focus in and out, and it gives you a set of values and numbers and all that. But I can't show you that at the moment. And then once I've properly focused. And then when I want to go to an object, I'll go to the object while I'm on a view, or I'm on an image. The telescope will slew in and hope for the best with your alignment that the telescope uh, view will be in here, or more or less. If it's not, you can always essentially adjust it. But once it's in there and it's properly focused, I click on the capture thing here, and it will then I can set my exposures and all that, and, and, and then activate the camera. And that's basically my um, my EasyCab. Um, that's my uh, imaging capture program that I use for DSOs, and it works for me. It's really simple. Um, when I have time, I will demonstrate a proper session, all right, to uh, let you guys know. And you can see that I'm gonna basically do this is what I'm gonna do. This is what I'm gonna do. Step by step, clear guide, you know, guide, so you guys don't get lost. All right, how I do it. Alright, some guys might do it different for me, but this is basically a for your guys to so you know that what sort of um, a general idea we're looking at. Now, usually when I'm when I'm uh, imaging, right, once I've got the image in there, I then I minimise that. I minimise that, right, and leave it running. Basically, that program is still running. And then what I do is. Before I start taking images, I click on PhD Guiding. Now, PhD Guiding, you have to download this from Stark Labs, all right, uh, dot com, and download the latest version, 1.14, all right, and that's what I do. And basically, Stark Lab is basically your guide scope. Basically, you set your guide scope in there, connect all your USB, and then power it up. Let the computer run by itself, and then simply, this is how easy it is. You go through where you open it up and you get a little box, okay? You go into file, alright, and it gives you different things. Now, click on camera, okay? You click on camera, right? Now, you don't need to worry with all this stuff. Um, usually, um, it's usually trial and error. Now, I'm not going to bother with all the settings, but I'm just going to give you a general idea how I do it. Basically, what I do now, I connect it to connect camera. This will give me a series of cameras all right, that will be adaptable. Now, don't worry if your camera's not in there. I usually use the 5 QH52 or whatever, anything on there. If it's not a camera that's in there, usually some cameras will be like a Windows webcam style camera, which for, for most beginners, you can use a webcam for auto guiding, believe it or not. You just need the right sort of equipment and the right connections for it to work, all right. So you can actually use a webcam attached to the guide scope. Once you've got that, it'll give you a uh, camera mode or whatever. It'll give you a selection of what images you want. I usually set select that, all right. Just set as prefix like that, okay. Now, what will usually happen is that you, you know, your, your camera's activated, all right. And then what you do is, before you do anything, you click on the loop button, okay. Right, you click on the loop button, and what happens is, right, I've got, I've got my face here. Right, it's, uh, I've also haven't got my, um, my guide scope connected. But basically, I set my exposure time. Now, usually I set it to one to two minutes, but it's a bit too slow. Okay, so I set, I set it as, as one to two, two seconds. And then what I do is now, usually what happens is. Um, you just imagine that if there's a star here or whatever, you'll see points of light. Now, if there isn't, you've got to focus like you do with the uh, the telescope uh, camera on the CCD. You have to adjust the focus until you get pinpoints of light of stars. Once you've got the stars focus on, because basically this is a live image, all right. Once you've done that, you basically click on the box, all right. Keep clicking, all right. Now usually, you see that bit that there, if it's green, that's usually a star, right, the star's moving, that green box is there, basically you press stop, okay, you press stop, and then what you do is, 
you connect to the camera, okay, obviously it's not connected to the telescope. And then what you do is you press this button here called PHD. Now that PHD will set the calibration. Alright, so you're setting the calibration on there. Alright, but I'm going to stop that. But basically what happens there, it will set a calibration on there. Alright, and it will work out how the star's moving. So basically if the star's moving up and down on that. So it basically tests all the axes of the, of the mount. Alright, and figures out how the star is moving. Once it's calculated that, it will then work it out how to adjust the backlash of the gears, on the drive motor and so forth. And it will take a long time, you know, and it takes some time to do. And what that does is, is once that's done, it will say calibration complete, and then the screen will, you'll have that box there, and that box will stay green, and then you get two two crosshairs across that line that that will label green. Once that's on there, that will show you that it's guiding. And that basically, once that's guiding, then you can go back. You can either minimize that, okay, minimize that. And basically, you leave two programs running. You go back easy cap and from easy cap you then start click on capture and then you start go to your planner right and you start just in how many uh, times frames how many um, frames of I want to do uh, 60 seconds of exposure time and I'm going to repeat that 10 times or so okay and you set your set, uh, exposure times and, and so forth right and you can do a series of things you can create a folder for all your files to go on and then you just click start and let the cat on see if your guide is good and the telescope's running all right basically you provide the image is still in the um, on, on the screen you click start and then let it just run through okay you if something goes wrong with the trailing or something's gone wrong with the tracking or guiding you can click uh, full stop okay and what that does is it will cancel um it will cancel the actual it doesn't cancel each frame but it'll cancel the process all right but it'll still store some of the frames into your hard drive on your computer all right so that's basically a general run around how i do it okay this is the, it is very very simple now it doesn't have to be too complicated and that's what i'm trying to show you guys that CCD imaging is not hard, it's really easy. Now, obviously, this demonstration doesn't show you what I'm actually doing, but when I do set up and the sky's clear, I will be doing a live demonstration of how I do it. So, for you guys out there, right, basically get your programs, okay, for your CCD. Now, usually you use the program with the CCD, but I would seriously recommend you download your Polar Finder. You can also download Polar Finder to save uh, disk space. You, know, you can download it as an iPhone app, so you can actually use uh, Polar Finder on your iPhone. Uh, Easy Cap is usually with the QHY uh, cameras only, but it just depends what CCD you get. Most CCDs usually come with software capture programs anyway, so and that's what I use. All right, and then I use. Uh, then I use PhD guiding as my main guiding software. And basically you have two programs running at the same time. Alright, it's that easy. But again, this is just a, a very, very brief demonstration to show you guys that what I do on my setup. Now you can see that it does, my laptop or my netbook runs really, you know, it runs both programs, no problems or so. Okay, and I'm and I'm basically recording this on a Cam Studio recorder as well, so it's pretty impressive the laptop, and it just shows you don't need a powerful uh, laptop to do this. Now, the more the better, the better it runs. But for me, the netbook, because being a small portable device, it runs sufficient. But basically, for diesel imaging, I use EasyCap and PhD Guiding. Now, I'm not going to go too much on ShortCap. 
or um, Easy Planet at the moment. But well, basically, this these two softwares is um, Shortcut in particular is for the guys who have webcams and they want to image the moon or the planet. This is a really good uh, program. This is basically um, a, a freeware program. Okay, I believe that it's RWG is the guy who does it. Uh, basically, it's like uh, Easy Cap in a way, but you can use webcams. Okay. To capture your, uh, your software, all right, and it, it's it's quite it's quite good, all right. But you can do non-exposure uh, stuff as well with this. But I don't want to go too much in depth because I don't want to lose people track of it. But basically, that's a webcam sort of uh, image capture program. Uh, and then this one here is basically for um, the QHY uh, uh, cameras only. Um, basically, uh, I have the IMG. Um, 132 uh, e and basically this is basically I run my uh, my planetary camera and I take photos with this but I don't want to go too much in detail but the main focus of today is to highlight a, a, a typical um, setup for diesel imaging now these are the only three programs that I use uh, if I want to image uh, planets for example I do not have to use PhD guiding. There is no requirement to run PhD guiding at all to uh, to image planets because there's no need. Because what I do is I do a short footage of a planet for about 30, maybe 60 seconds long. All right, as, as long as that. It's not very long at all, and there's no need for guiding. So I never use PhD guiding for um, for imaging planets or the moon. And EasyCap is my main diesel or deep sky objects uh, um, capture program. So the only two I use is mainly once I've got the Polar Finder, you know, a rescue adjusted on the amount, I just use these two and that is it for diesel imaging. The rest of the stuff, the planetary, I just use them alone. Uh, but I, I just thought it would be a good idea to show you a, you know, a very brief demonstration, but later on, when the stark skies do clear and it, you know, and I basically get my telescopes running, I will do a proper, proper live setup and an example and demonstrate to you guys how I set it up because Blue Knob, as you see how I do it, it is so simple. It really is. I don't know why it makes it so complicated for most people. Um, that's a problem at some of the forums. You ask some advice to certain people, certain people got a different way of understanding. At least with this demonstration, you can clearly see how how we do it, or how I do it. Now, everyone's going to be different than mine, but I just thought to give you a good general idea of what you can do. All right, so I hope this is good, uh, good uh, sort of advice for you guys. All right, please feel free to ask any questions on um, Astronomy for Beginners. And then, thanks again, and uh, please guys, and uh, goodbye. Hi guys, I've just, uh, I've just checked the, the weather now. And it looks like it's looking a bit clear now certain areas in my area is a bit patchy it's not perfect conditions but i can get away with a bit of patchy cloud there and then well, obviously in winter i'm going to show you my imaging how i'm going to i'm going to take them to my location and we're going to set up there over there and um, basically i'm going to show you step by step what i do what things i do Okay, when I set up and all that, um, and then I'll show you um, what I do with I use the CCD using the uh, imaging capture software using um, e e EasyCap, and then from there I will see line do the two star line, and, and, and also I'll show you the pole fine and I use that, and then from there I will then set up the guide scope ready to do some guiding using PhD guiding. Now obviously these are not ideal conditions because the, the clouds are still there 
little bits of patchy cloud, but there's clear, there's clear bits. So hopefully, if they clear up a bit, maybe we can get some imaging. Now, my main focus of today, I'm, I'm on about imaging um, M31, which is the Andromeda Galaxy. I go for an easy diesel, I go for, so it's easy to locate, it's easy to find, and so also the moon is out, and it's not ideal again. I mean, if you're imaging for diesels, ideally you're looking for is, is look is imaging with well the moon being there and you've got no clouds. But it all depends, you see. You can get away with some conditions with clouds. It is a bit windy, mind you, so I'm just hoping, hope for the best, that my tr it's not going to affect my tracking or my balancing and all that because it's a bit windy. But hopefully it should die down and ready for me to image. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to go to our other location and then show you guys what we're going to do next. Right now guys, just a, a general interest is for those who was wondering that, that um, just, I'm just going to show you something about how you pack your, um, your telescope equipment and all that and the imaging equipment. Now this is an example, this this is back, basically the back boot of my car and I've got quite a lot of equipment in here, alright, but it just proves one thing that I managed to get everything in here, my you know, guide school box, I've got my eyepiece um, collection, I've got my, uh, my ED 80mm Lunt Apple Refractor Telescope and I've got my, one of my power tanks, I've got the EQ mount here housing its brilliant Geo Optic bag followed by also my seat, warm kit as well. Alright, the table's underneath there, you can't, I don't think you can see that, so we'll shut that, okay. And then following, now as you notice I've just got one seat down down here and here I've got two of my other batteries here as well all right and at the front two seats free so I can take a passenger if I want to but basically I managed to get all this equipment in the Golf all right it just shows you a lot of room um, again I usually lower the other seat down if you want to get me here you know any Q6 mount and my uh, 8 inch Quattro as well and other cameras as well so I have to lower that down if I want to get the other stuff in there but I thought just as general interest to just to show to you guys what you can do when you get your kit organized and prepped up ready for a imaging session or observing session and right everyone uh, I'm in my location um, it doesn't look good on the clouds though I'm afraid but um, this is my ideal location um, there's a bit of a clearing over there, but we'll see how bad it's going to be. But uh, hopefully, if it does clear up, um, that'll be brilliant. I'll start my setup and all that. But uh, as you can see, bit of it more in the wilderness actually out here. Yeah, you know, it's pretty. Uh, it's pretty um, in the world. You know, pretty uh, remote. I mean, this is really this is about six miles away from my location, so it's quite some way. I have got a road just down the road here, which is all right, but it's away from light pollution, uh, from the light anyway. So I'm shielded against the woods. So obviously the woods around here is shielding a lot of the light. So I'm not I'm not too bad actually. But this is my location. This is where I set my telescopes and do some of the imaging. Yeah, you know, and uh, yeah. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to, I'm going to set up my telescopes now, well, the, the imaging scope, and then hope for the best if it clears, and then I'll do my demonstration. Okay guys, um, I can't get the, uh, the program of uh, Cam Studio to work, so I'm going to have to make do with just using my camera, which is a bit of a shame really, um, because the program's not working right very well, and it looks like I have to get connected to the internet. So what I'll do is I'm going to show you a demonstration on using Polar Finder. As you can see here, just bear with me. All right, I'll just turn down the the light. Basically, I've got my reticle set up. All right, and you can see Polaris is at the angle there. It's basically um, in that position. I've just adjusted my coordinates which are just there which is longitude 085100 Eastings basically what I've done there 
is I adjusted the mirror settings there and I got my uh, location, believe it or not, from my trusty handset which you can actually find that yourself. Now usually if you use uh, Google Maps you can get the location there. I actually use the um, uh, my GPS to get my location anyway. So basically what I'm going to do is now right, basically I've got my, uh, my lunch set up anyway. Now usually I just usually don't set up my telescope anyway um, but because it's a small refractor I can get away with doing the adjustment and with all the kit, I basically got me my camera here, and I basically got my red dot finder. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically move the reticule according to its states on on the um, on polar finder. Okay, so I'm going to use polar finder. Now it's not quite dark, but it, but the camera is not doing any justice at the moment. But um, basically, I'm going to line up the the reticule. Okay. I'm going to turn the telescope so I can get the, uh, the actual. Uh, now it's balanced already because I've always put the cables and all that to get the the balance right. Okay, I then lock it up, expose this side glass. Okay. All right, and what I'm going to do is now. And what I'm doing now is I'm going to adjust the reticle by loosening the RA axis. All right, and I'm going to tilt it so that I get uh, so that I get the reticle as it states through uh, polar finder. Okay guys, I've adjusted pol Polaris, uh, the reticule now, at the angle as it looks. And basically what I'm going to do now, obviously polar line in that reticule for polar alignment. Okay, and that's the reticule set. Basically now what you do, as you do, okay, all I'm going to do now is when I get polar alignment, I adjust these uh, screws here, obviously the, the latitude and the altazimuth bolts, and I just centralise that reticle towards Polaris, right? Now, this is the reason why I don't actually uh, um, put the telescopes together, right? Because you see at the angle now, all right, the telescope's virtually upside down and almost hitting uh, the tripod. Now that's the reason why I always um, uh, do this one first before I put the telescope together and all that. But uh, now if you've got a small refractor and all that, it's just tra trial and error really. So you're going to have to uh, take it bit by bit, see if it will do it on your telescope, right? But not all telescopes like this will be able to allow you to do this. So wherever this reticle is set now, and I've got to pull a line it and I've also got to readjust it. Okay, so uh, I thought for the, this will show you an example of why I do not um, put the telescope on and, and the camera and all that and so forth. So I always do it without it. Also, I'll take the counterweight as well. That'll be off. Everything will be off. It'll be just the mount for me to do this properly. But I just thought I'd just do you a demonstration why I uh, don't put the telescope and the counterweights and all that. I adjusted the. Uh, the altazimuth and the latitude bolts, okay, without touching any of the locks. Don't touch these locks at all on the RA and the declination axis, all right? Do not touch them. As you adjust the uh, polar alignment and you've got it, that polaris in the center circle. Now, obviously, the camera won't going to show you exactly, but I'll check on there if it will, if it will show up. Okay, all right, I've got Polaris in the reticle now. Now, I don't know if it's on the, the on the camera itself, but I'm now polar line now, okay, with that reticle now fixed. All right, then what I do is I will then rotate, loosen the RA uh, axis now, okay, because that decal now is fixed. And I'm just going to confirm as I rotate the telescope, okay, I'm basically I'm checking to see if that Polaris is still within the big circle and it's not levelled out, okay. If it's all within there, you're now polar aligned. Right, okay guys, uh, now what we do now, there's no need to use a uh, polar finder, okay, you can cancel that off. Enough. 
Right. Now the oscilloscope's now polar aligned. Right. I've now set it to the home position. Okay. Bear in mind the telescope, uh, the spirit level is now um, is now uh, level, and now the scope is now pointing north. Now basically now I'm going to set up the camera and all that, and then and do a two star alignment using the red dot finder, and then using my camera as an eyepiece, and then do my two star alignment from there. Okay guys, I'm doing my two star alignment, okay, um, I'm one of the fortunate ones to get one of these GPS units, I know they're expensive, but they work really well, and uh, basically what they do is, is they'll give me exact coordinates where I am on earth, the date, the time, everything, so I don't need to do them with nothing, right, it takes a couple of minutes to boot up, because it's what it's trying to do is trying to find a satellite. Once it's locked onto a satellite, satellite, it'll then uh, go through a procedure and all that. And once it's got a location, all I do is a GPS fix there. So basically, it's found a, um, a satellite, and I'll just basically go through. Yeah, warning signs. There's my position of Polaris, which we've already set anyway. Okay, so you don't need to bother with that. And we do alignment. Okay. And also you're going to do now is do a two star alignment, which is probably the best alignment, okay? And it'll let me allow to choose the star. So basically I'm going to hook up the camera and switch on my red dot finder. And then I'm going to use the uh, the telescope, slew the telescope to a bright star and then line it up. Okay guys, um, basically now I have got the camera running. I'm going to start up um, I'm going to start up uh, easy cap which is there okay and it gives me the screen then I select uh, camera okay uh, I select camera and I click on QHY 8L QHYL right basically this is my focus thing what I do is on this screen here now I don't know if you can see it on this bit here I select the gain to max select the gain to max uh, I've got my exposure at 300 milliseconds I then go over here and press on cross basically what that does it gives me a crosshair which I can use to uh, centralize the star then I click on to live and what that does gives me a live uh, image of what I'm seeing then I proceed to camera set up and select temperature uh, temperature control okay gives me my temperature I sit to all control, control at the bottom of there and then I Put it to the setting to about minus 21. That'll be my temperatures uh, cooling down the camera to get eliminate all the noise. Right. I then set a planner. I always set a planner and I always make a uh, folder. M31. Okay. Is my uh, folder and I can select that find out my folder, I'll put it on my desktop because it's easier that way, then I can create my folder and then start it there. Alright, I'm not going to start it up now, alright, I've set my folder, alright, and basically what I'm doing is I'm going to minimise that. Right, now at the moment it's still doing a live image, which I can't see anything at the moment, but um, what we're going to do is I'm going to do my two star alignment. Basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my red dot finder all right I'm going to use my red dot finder in there all right and centralize the star and then into the into the uh, QHY ATL I've got I've got um, I'm selecting Vega as one of my alignment stores now basically what I do is then I've got it in the camera all right using red dot finder lined it up with Vega and then is 
I'm going to adjust the telescope. Vega will come to focus. We're getting Vega now. We're adjusting it while the focus very slowly. Okay. And then what I'm doing is you don't have to get perfectly focused, but then what you do is then you line up Vega. Now don't forget it'll be delayed because of the exact exposure. So basically you want to get it to the crosshair. Alright, keep lining it up. Alright, and then line up Vega. Now set the rate to a smaller rate, so... And then what you try and do is you try and get this as accurate as possible. Alright. Right, bang, bingo. We're, we're bang on Vega. Right, at this point then... All right, click off, um, click off live, and what I do is, we're going to try and focus the object, okay? So you go to preview again, go to preview, right? Click on Vega, okay? That's your focus area now, and then you go to focus. You click on live on here, and then you got Vega there. And what you try and do, you got these set numbers here. And what you're trying to do with these set numbers is you're going to try and adjust um, Vega spot on. Get the lower the number, the better the sharpness of the view. Okay. Alright, I'm going out of that. So I go back on myself. And then try and get Vega as low value as you can get. Right, I've gone back so it's gone bigger. So I go back on myself using the fine tune on my focuser. And once you're happy, right now, Vega is now the sharpest I can get it and the lowest value I can get it as well. Alright, now they just need to lower it down. I've got round about, um, got round about two, round about two, okay, which is really accurate. The lower that number, but that just depends on the atmospheric conditions. If the earth allows it, you can go even lower and go to, to zero, all right? But that's the lowest I can get, and I'm happy with that focus, okay? That is now, I'll go back to preview, all right, and I go to live... Right, and I've got Vega centralised. Okay, now I'm going to, I'm happy with that, and I'm going to select another star now. Okay, the next star. Okay, I've got Doobie. Now I'm going to centralise it into the CCD, into the crosshair, right in the middle. So, just bear with, just as I'm moving it, this is very difficult when you've got one hand to it. I'm getting really close, okay. Alright, once you're on that crosshair, bingo. Right, then it'll say, on there, alignment successful, and then this gives you the coordinates about your pole alignment. Now, my pole alignment is slightly out, so I can have to do a realign, okay. On the polar rear line. It's a shame really because I was just about so basically I go out and I go polar line. Alright, this is very important now. If you've got version 3.35, alright, this is the option you can go through. Now basically what it does is it lets me select a star. Okay. Just lets us select a star. Okay. 
basically I've selected Doobie again as my um, alignment star for realign for polar realign and basically it's telling me to readjust the keys all right I'm happy that it's in view already all right so I've centered it okay and then it will ask me to right this is how much it's off elevation which is zero four five three okay then what it does it will slew out a position to see how far I'm, I'm away out of alignment okay well that's pretty good actually so what I do now is it'll tell me to now adjust the uh, latitude now the altitude so basically I go to my mount and I adjust my latitude bolts okay the basically the up and down of the mount right then I've adjusted my altitude bolts and I'm center with Doobie then I press enter on the handset then it'll give me the coordinates I am bang on zero zero degrees now it will ask me about my altars now I need to adjust my altars so I press enter it will then slew Doobie again alright it will slew it back down and then it will tell me my value of how far away now I'm not too much now so basically I'll do the same again and I'll adjust the left and right or altars and more I've adjusted bolts. Right. I've now adjusted my altars uh, altars and more bolts I'm now center I then press enter at the handset oh my god I am now fully fully polo line now zero 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 bang on I am now extreme polo aligned and now I'm going to now do my exposures but first off I can leave the telescope to track all right and now what I'm going to do now is set up the guide scope take off the red dot finder put the guide scope in and then we'll proceed then after that Right then, my pole alignment is that spot on that that star has not even moved and that, that's how accurate my pole alignment is gone. Basically what I do now is I now minimise that. I leave, um, basically what I'm doing now, I've le left um, easy cap on and then what I'm going to do now, I've connected the guide scope. I've now launched PhD guiding and it opens up my file. What I do is, PhD is now up, I select camera. Now, for this camera, I have to go to, to um, SCOM Lake Camera. And then click OK. This will give me the camera. It will now hook the QH, uh, it will hook the QHY5 guide cam okay now I click on this brain first alright the settings now I can't really show you exactly it's not very clear at all is I go to car I go to the telescope the mount is connected okay it's on selecting the mount on the top I select my exposure to one second okay one second is good or you can select two seconds then I press the loop button which is just here I've got two stars on the screen now all right they look really good potential uh, guys stars now basically what I'm doing is I'm using on here on the actual guy scope itself I'm actually going to move uh, the three screws so that I can get them really central as I can okay right I'm more or less there not have to be spot on basically now I've got two stars there I then click stop down the bottom 
I then loop it again just to make sure that they're not hit heat spots or hot pixels. Okay, all right, they're genuine. Basically, what you're looking for is you click on the star. If it turns green, okay, like there, it's green now. Okay, I had to do that. You then press stop. Okay, press stop on there. All right, and then you press this button here. All right, which is not showing. PhD, the, the bullseye. You click on that, and then what it does, it will go through a sequence, a calibration, right, and it will take probably 10 to 15 minutes. And what it's doing is it's going to work out how the star moves. When the star moves, okay, it will then work it out, and then just you're going to have to wait a while till it goes through the motions, all right? So it may take around about 10 to 15 minutes, but as long as it starts calibration you just okay then guys what's happened now right you see a screen here at this bottom here and it says guiding basically now it's gone it's done its calibration and that that's what you get you'll get a crosshair green crosshair indicating that that now that that is guiding the guy scopes guiding the mount telling you where to go and all that and all right and that is now guiding basically as we look into um, we're looking to easy cap we can now see that we are guiding uh, at uh, Dubai now we could actually take long exposures on there but we're not going to do that because stars are a little bit boring we want something a bit more interesting so basically we're going to click out of that all right and then we're going to stop guiding all right wheeling enough because there's no need to guide all right, and then we're going to slew the telescope towards now. Because now I'm doing a, a live shot of the Andromeda Galaxy. Now you can't really see it until when I up the gain. Okay, if I up the up the gain, we'll find. Okay, we've now up the gain, and we've actually got Andromeda just there, right? Just uh, this is only at 10 seconds. Now 10 seconds has appeared on the screen just there. So basically. What we're going to do now, we will begin with um, guiding. Now, um, we found a guide star, star, but it's not seemed to guide quite well. So, I'm going to stop that, and then I'm going to click on that. Uh, I'm going to loop again. So, I'm starting to guide now. And then we're going to take a actual capture. Now we're going to do a, a, a not going to capture the full the, as yet, but we're going to set the um, we've gone back to um, easy cap. Okay, I'm going to set it to about a. We're just going to go like a 75 second exposure time, right? And then we're going to capture it. Now we're guiding. But um, we had a bit of a few clouds and all that, and it seems to be hitting the uh, hitting the guiding quite a bit actually, and it just doesn't seem to be going quite well for us. Don't forget, clouds will play havoc on this. Don't seem to be doing quite well at all. It's still remaining green, but it should be locked on. But we'll see how the image will produce. We we'll just um, basically we're going to minimise that, and hopefully we should get we should get. If I do the slider down. I'm just going to get it so it's on the screen. Hopefully, you should see uh, the first exposure. Now, this exposure isn't going to uh, it isn't going to um, save it on the computer. Basically, it's like a trial. And there we are. We have got an image of um, of Andromeda. But the guiding's not very great, so I'm going to have to readjust the guiding. But we just proves now we've got an image there, but it's okay, not guys, that great. Okay, uh, guys. Because of the clouds and all that being a bit of a pain, I've had to I had to use a bright star. 
now it seems to be guiding better now so basically we did the same process as, as always I cancel out the guiding and then restart the program again and she's now guiding now hopefully I minimize it hopefully if we do a trial exposure we should get Andromeda somewhere in the region now we just have to um, we're doing a trial error now we're going to figure out now if those uh, errors on the uh, things have been sorted out now now you see where the trailing is now that can happen that could be either the clouds are doing it or there could be wind because don't forget the winds also doing it it seems to be uh, not as jaggedy because usually you see these tra trails here they're going straight now if they start to zigzag you've also got problems with backlash I mentioned but these are uh, more or less straight so that tells me that it's either the clouds that's causing this or I've not used the correct guy star or something like that but it all depends every night now I had spot on polar alignment so it shouldn't be that because I've got that absolutely spot on so basically what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to eliminate this trailing now so I've choose I've choose the better guys to her and hope for the best it will give me a decent exposure. Hopefully trying to get those stars pinpoint. Alright, so hope for the best. Oh voila, look at that. This is what we're trying to achieve now. So um there is a slight sort of uh, drifting, so if I go to PhD again maybe I can uh, set that to 0.5 so make it just that a little bit because it's too bright that star because don't forget even bright stars will also affect the tracking as well so we've basically got Andromeda there now now it's it's a bit tiny at the moment but the central nucleus is there but uh, I'm trying to lower the game because we don't want too much of the game because we don't want the noise and all that in there um, I also want to uh, set it. I'm getting still a few hot pixels in there so I'm basically setting the, the temperature okay to I'm basically going to because it's a warm night, minus 28, so try and minimise as much as this hot pixels. Now it's eliminated most of it, alright, so it's more or less there, so I might do a 2.2 bin and see what happens from there. Now what this binning is, 1 to 1 is basically uh, the maximum resolution, alright, and basically it makes your image big. Um, and also you get the more resolution and detail but what 2 time 2 binning does it lowers the, the screen smaller and basically what it's doing is it's, it's lowering that but it makes the camera much more sensitive but the pro is though uh, the longer the, the, the thing what you if you lower the 2.2 binning down it will also lower the resolution so Andromeda isn't going to be spectacularly uh, clear for high resolution but what it does do is it speeds up the, in the actual speed of the exposure a lot more so basically you're going to get faster timings for if you select two times two binning because basically one times binning is one times one binning gives you the maximum resolution in a big picture but you, it make, it's a much more slower exposure time where 2.2 binning will give you a, a much more um, smaller picture but a lot less defined uh, so basically now we've, we've got the image now I'm going to try and find it now because I've reduced the size so hopefully she should be somewhere Okay, I reduced the binning and yeah, 
now I've got Andromeda there now it just looks like I've just got the central nucleus now there is a cloud there but I managed to get Andromeda there and it's a lot brighter and the image seems to be a lot better now but the, the only thing is oh the moon's coming up and the bloody drastic clouds is playing about so basically this is the reason why we need clear skies it's perfect but it's managed to get the stars even through the cloud cover I'm really quite impressed so what I'm going to do now I'm going to set my planner and I'm going to set M31 again on my folder so I, I maximize that so if it wants to pop up okay and I'm going to uh, two time two binning I'm going to set the exposure now it was around about it was around about 75 so I'm going to try and do uh, say like a 200 seconds and I'm just going to do just one now that's true about uh, CCD imaging you've got to trial and error this alright so So I click on the box there, gives me two tools to be in with 200 times second exposures and I will see what sort of uh, outcome we get. Don't forget, I mean, I'm quite impressed that uh, I managed to uh, take an image of uh, Andromeda Galaxy despite through the clouds and all that. It's a pity I can't get uh, Cam Studio working so you could see this bit better. But uh, you can, I can still see it on screen, like right? so. Yeah, we can just see the central nucleus, like from there. So what we do is now we'll just let. Um, I set it at 200 seconds at the moment, and uh, see what happens there. Now the guiding seems to be holding steady. Yeah, she's holding steady, so. She's still guiding, all right. She's not usually. If the guiding starts to throw out or goes out of position, it'll beep it here. It'll beep it here, saying it starts to lose its alignment star. Now, uh, hopefully, this will start to um, appear. Get this image of um, Andromeda to its um, lovely sort of structure. We suppose. Now, bear in mind. Now, because I forgot my vertical juicer, this will speed up the uh, the speed of the scope and collect more light better. But unfortunately, um, for me being a bit of an idiot, like for forgetting one thing, and and that is a vertical juicer. But it's not to worry because I've got F7, and F7 will give me a reasonable sort of uh, you know exposure sort of times. It's not it's not out of the world. Um, so basically what I'm doing now, I'm just waiting out on this screen now. This will store this frame particularly. I always like to do a trial frame. And once I've got all that, that frame and it's running perfectly, and I managed to get an exposure at that time of that, then basically I'll say, right, then I'll just basically pump loads of frames in there and get that exposure on there. But um, I've taken off the fil red filter in there because I want you to see this. Hopefully there should be some nice colours in there appearing on there. But uh, I'm impressed so far that at the moment I've managed to get my pole alignment spot on. But um, even though you've got correct pole alignment, I'm still doing long exposures of even to 75 seconds. And even when the guy has gone uh, haywire, so it just shows you that pole alignment is really is the key to long exposure photography. All right, so hope for the best that this is sorted out the tracking. Now there's no guarantee it's going to work, and voila! Oh, I'm impressed with that. Look at that. The image is not. It doesn't. It, this, this is not doing any justice at the moment. But uh, I reckon now I can force that to about uh, 300 seconds now. I'm impressed with that. That's really good. So I'm going to set my capture folder. And I'm going to s 
Now, true about Andromeda is you don't want to blow out the stars and all that. So, what I'm doing is I'm going to do uh, loads of 300s. And I'm going to repeat that to 20 frames. Okay. Then I set my bin into to 2 again. I'm going to lower that to... I'm going to set the frames now to about... 200 frames set that to uh, say like 10 for example 10 frames set that again I'm going to set one to 100 uh, frame 100 seconds to t um, I reckon uh, 15 frames Okay, and then do like a small exposure of 60 seconds, so that I don't want to blow out the core that much. Alright, so I'll do loads of frames of them, 25 frames, okay. I take these boxes here, alright, now this is not doing any justice, I'm sorry guys, but this is not helping as much as I should have. But uh, I'm just going now, start my exposure time okay and it's now starting it the thing is about uh, imaging is that um, you're trying to collect as much light frames as you can the more you get those light frames the more you can stack and the stacking is when it really comes out now this is just a raw image and yet you can still, you can just get the hint of the banding here and the dark lanes already with 200 seconds exposure. Alright, now because of the, the laptop, because uh, of the camera, it's, it's blowing out that central uh, obstruction here which is a bit of a shame because that shouldn't be like that. The camera is just not that sensitive to, but what I'm seeing it, I can see the centre core and the band, two banding lanes already, just from here and then to here. All right, but um, what I'm doing is now I'm doing it 300 second exposures, and um, I'm just collecting that data. And once you're happy with it, I mean this is this is what you're hoping to achieve. The stars need to be pinpoint. There's no tracking errors and all that. It seems to be running fine, and that's basically what you want. Once you've got that running, you leave the tracking alone, don't touch it, don't touch the guiding, unless something goes wrong, and just capture and capture light frames. Keep tr t getting that there, alright? But again, it's okay guys, um, this is playing havoc with my, um, my tracking's going alright, believe it or not, but this cloudy, hazy stuff is playing havoc on my image. Now... I've done 300 um, seconds and like you say, the image started to deteriorate with the clouds going past and all that and uh, a bit, a bit uh, sort of uh, disappointed at the moment that um, the track is remaining good but um, basically I've just got to keep going, I mean you're going to get some horrible frames, alright, it just I mean, it's just a bad night for me because the clouds are uh, like coming and going and ruining the image. Um, but the yeah, air is pretty steady, I'll give you that. But you see, um, like I say, you've got to keep capturing the frames. You're going to get bad frames no matter what. So just just keep going, and just keep going. All right, and that's the, that's the problem. You know, image is not easy, but. The good thing is though, I'm a polo aligned and I'm well chuffed with that. That is the best polo alignment I've ever done. Also, I've noticed that the telescope seems to run a lot better after that overhaul on the EQ5 mount, which has run absolutely amazing now. And uh, I'm absolutely impressed what what it's done to the, uh, the, the movement on that. Now, the moon's coming up, as always, ruining the other stuff. Luckily, I'm, I'm using a filter. Um, basically an astronomy um, CLS filter on the CCD so it'll try and cut down the light pollution as much as I can from the moon but um, hopefully when Andromeda gets higher up in the sky it should be a lot more clearer and the image will be a bit more defined 
so I've just got to keep catching the frames I'm afraid guys so like I say um, I've just got to keep going I'll just keep going and keep going I'll say I hope this this uh, this two tours helps you a little bit I'm a bit to this point about using uh, the uh, <laughs> the cam studio is not working as it should but uh, I'm hope that you've got some sort of information in there now I will do another guide to show you clearly how easy cap is running and how is uh, uh, the guiding thing is working as well the PhD guiding so like I say we'll uh, I'm just gonna keep running through and I'll, I'll hopefully should get a decent image to show you when the clouds clear and it's in the high up in the sky it should reveal some better detail than this and also it just just shows you now you will get occasional things as well like if you get streaks or something like that where the stars are pinpoint but you get one street across that that believe it or not is a satellite or a last droid or something's going across the sky but it just shows you what what it does you know when you've got clouds like this now that's not a very good image of andromeda i'm afraid but hopefully when it she gets higher up in the sky away from these pesky clouds then it should be fine it should be getting better than that so we'll uh we'll just switch this off now hi guys still continue to take some exposures um however that cloud is still playing hell up uh i noticed when the moon's up and all that it's starting to blot out uh, the galaxy and all that so i had to lower it down to um just the five minutes now and uh, even this I'm really pushing it so the thing is I, I tried the 600 seconds and the tracking and the guiding still remained which was good but it totally washed out the actual image and I'm gonna just gonna show you the the actual image from I mean the guiding's fine but I'm just gonna show you the actual image that almost washed it completely out uh, you can see now, you can see the banding and all that, but you can see it's it's starting to wash that the the actual image out big time because of the cloud and the moon. Uh, the the filter is helping; it's making me doing longer exposures now. If I didn't have that filter, I wouldn't be able to take that image there. But I'm quite impressed that what I've got there. I mean, I can still use that; it's a good uh, image. So I'll just see what happens. We just got to keep collecting that data. Oh, right, um, finally back from uh, observing, a bit tired, and uh, I had to quick rubber suddenly because the clouds got that thick, the, the hazy patches were starting to um, drown the stars and my image also ruined big time so basically I, I managed to just pack it up and managed to get around about 39 light frames uh, with the light frames consist of 300 seconds uh, 100 seconds a few 50 seconds and, and like quite a few 200 seconds as well so and um, I've just managed to deep stack I use deep sky stacker to stack the frames. Now the reason why you collect these exposures is what you're trying to do is you're trying to stack the image. You're making the image much more. Uh, you basically, in a way, you stack it and you you you're stenciling over each image. You pick out the best image and you stack on top of the other images so you create a final image, making one complete image stand out a bit more. And stacking is really important. Hence the reason. The more data you collect, the better that image is going to be become. Now, it just depends on certain aspects. Now, because of my, um, I was imaging not ideal conditions. You know, you could do a lot of high exposures and all that and not produce really stunning results. Now, every night from night, the image might vary, all right, due to certain cloud conditions, weather conditions, um, uh, transparency of the sky. 
you name it, and the atmospheric conditions, it all varies big time. And you just get a different uh, image quality in result. Now, obviously for me, the moon was against me, the clouds was against me, <laughs> um, and then slight of the wind was going against me. I, and basically, I, the reason why I did this, guys, is to illustrate to you guys that you're not going to be guaranteed. I mean, this is this is true. You're not going to guarantee you're going to get a one. You'll be running your image 100%. Now, but the thing is about this 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 guy that I was telling you about is I wish I was showing you how I work with my kit, how to get polar lines, how to get it, you know, repolarized using the uh, using the pole finder and. What boils down to is, as I mentioned through all the other guys, I mentioned that one key thing is if your mount is 100% up and running, firmware updated, yeah, the, the, the polar scope is aligned, uh, then you've got all the gear, then also the, the tune ups I was going off. I was absolutely impressed that I was getting literally no drift at all. And I could actually pump it up to 10 minutes or more, and it just proves one thing: that the mount is the key. It doesn't matter what telescope you own that goes on top of that mount. The mount is the number one key to successful imaging. And the thing is, with um, a decent mount, is you need to capture that image as much as you can without the star trailing and all that. Now. I'm, I'm glad that I had a few problems along the way to just demonstrate to you guys that it's not a hook to be plain sailing for you guys. There's going to be one instance where you'll be setting up your gear and and something goes wrong. But the thing is, I, I, I thought I'd just go through my little guide and show you what higher face so that you be aware of what to expect, what the outcome will be. All right, and so I covered a lot of stuff through through that that, that night. All right, just. just to highlight a few things and all. Now that's the thing about uh, astro photography or imaging is that there's not a lot of YouTube for, or forums and all that or where there's done actual proper imaging uh, videos that actually highlight any of these problems. You know, and I've, I've, had, I've basically tried to do like a basic as I can term analogy so you guys will get it because astro photography photography is such a massive subject so and this is the reason why I wanted to do something like this is to demonstrate you guys and, and show people that it's not always place here it's not going to be easy but if you had some kind of guidance or something like that then you're a winner now this this tutorial this guidance was basically just trying to get the equipment running get it poor wide get it all square way to try and capture images. Now, for me, that doesn't stop there, because once you start learning how to use stacking software and all that, then you're in the another problem of basically processing the images, basically using Photoshop, using uh, Verizon, Paint Shop, all this software that makes your astrophoto stand out even more. But, um, but the thing is, I'm not going to cover that just yet. I mean, it's a massive subject as it is. And if you're one of these guys who are in the photography uh, business, who actually do this as a job, you, know, you will realise also what pro photo processing is all about. Uh, photo processing is all about. So also your guys will be aware. But for us, for like yourselves and some others, it's a, it's a very, it's another, another steep learning curve and it's constant you know, and there's times where I get frustrated trying to process the image. You'd be surprised that process, processing the images will reveal a lot of detail. Now when I first started out I only just got into grips of just happy to get a raw image and that was it. But when I found out that there was some guys on the forum saying well you can actually, pro I can process that image for you and they did that. But one thing that what annoyed me the most is, yeah, they were processing the image, but not telling me how. How do you do this? How do you do that? What's the reason? How how do you to get to that quality? And that's the problem of, to this site is that no one actually. There's a few people that will share ideas, and there's some that won't. And this is what I'm trying to 
um, to tell a lot of other guys is why don't we share their knowledge, share the knowledge for other beginners and people starting out, especially for myself. I mean, I didn't even know that you could do the stacking and all that when I first started out. But now because I was stacking, I produce a much, much better image. And obviously not outstanding quality or something, but I was happy with that image. And that's the thing, that's the main key. I'm trying to highlight it to you guys, right? It doesn't matter what quality image, what it is. Who cares what anyone says? Or you could do them this, or I could process that even better. No, actually, the main key f the thing is it's your image. As long as you're happy with that image, you're, and you're, that's your fine with it. That's the main key, right? That's the, you know, that's that's what you want to do. Now, obviously, as time goes by, you do want to progress further. Again, it's the learning curve. You just keep going and steadily, and you will get better. Everyone gets better. It's just practice makes perfect. But again, that's a good thing, that's the beauty about astral photography or imaging, is that it's, no matter what you do, you're always learning. And there's guys that have done this hobby for years and years, and they're still learning. And the thing is, it's still a book, it still it grabs you. Once you start imaging or taking photos of these sky objects or planets and, and what have you, you'll be hooked. You will be unbelievably hooked onto it. And, yeah, you know, but the thing is, you've got to invest a bit of money, a bit of time, and a bit of, you know, just working to it, and just practically just work and learn your way through it, and you will, everyone will get there producing absolutely stunning images. The only, the, big, the only biggest thing, the biggest pay that I, 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 I don't really particularly like is when you've got other guys who are really good astro photographers, and they do not like to share um, their knowledge and experiences and I don't know why that is, right? Some it's just a competition thing or whatever. But the thing is about some is it's all about sharing your ideas, sharing the knowledge and all that. And that's what I'm trying to get through to a lot of the guys. And this is why I like astronomy for beginners because I'm a beginner. I am I've done the astronomy for years. You know, I've done the astronomy for about twenty six years. But the thing is what well, I am I'm still learning. I'm still a beginner. Who cares? Well, the thing is, what I was, what uh, on to this guy I was to demonstrate to you guys is, I like to see films, I like to see visual evidence where I can say, oh, he did it that way, oh, I did it this way, because a lot of the forums do not describe that. People will tell you things, but don't actually mean exactly. For me, these guides help a long way, and what these guys do, they, you can see what I'm doing. And you can tell, and you can copy these out and say, I'm not going to promise you, I'm not going to guarantee it's going to work 100%. Alright? But the thing is, it gives you a general good idea, alright, for you, for what you have to do or what to do next and all that. And there may be some improvements you'd like to improve on top of what I do. Everyone's got different ways, right? As long as that way works for you, that's fine. Alright? And that's, that's the key. Right, to successful uh, imaging or astral photography. Now, for me, I'm just purely a CCD imager, right? I haven't got a DSLR. And to be honest with you, I think DSLR is much hot. I think it's a bit, I think it's a bit more complex, I, I think, especially with the camera setups and all that. That's why I like the CCD, because I can control the camera easily on the laptop. I find it easier that way. I don't know why that is, but as you can see for yourself, for the, uh, for the guy, you can see it's it's quite easy to use. It's just the biggest problem is setting up that equipment, getting that equipment set up in the correct ideal conditions, and that's what we're trying to do. All right, trying to get it so it's already ready to go, hunky dory, no balance problems, no other other stuff, and it's running, and you're getting there, those light problems, and that's the key. So, when so what I've done, uh, obviously that concludes to the. My my, uh, my example and the techniques of my imaging itself and um, and my techniques. Now they are my techniques. They work for me, but some people might have better ones than mine. Okay, but for me it works for me. I'm happy with that. I mean I, I use deep sky stacker. It's easier for me to stack it. I like easy cap. Again, it's an easy program. I like to use easy programs. Okay, they're not too advanced. But they work for me, and I get really good images, and that's the key. Um, basically, that, um, 
that includes the uh, my imaging uh, guide. I hope that this you've learned a lot from this guide. I've heard a lot, I've got a lot of big responses this time, uh, a lot of likes on Facebook and all that. Um, please feel free to ask any questions regarding some of the parts in that guide. All right, it would be interesting to get some feedback and from your guys. Um, what I'd like to, like to share with you is I've got two images. Now I've got, um, I'm just trying to uh, show you the difference between stacking. I'll show you a raw image of that, uh, that of, um, of the Andromeda itself. All right, and then I'll show you the stacked image. All right, and this is the reason why we do stacking to demonstrate what stacking and what it does makes a major difference on the image quality and then I'll do the final processing bit now the final processing bit is not one of my best ones right? it's not actually one of the best ones but I've used Photoshop uh, to, to produce this the only problem I've done wrong with this uh, is I've got dust molds on the, with black spots on the image but that's not a problem I mean I can use flats which I'm not going to go too into that because um, that could be another guide elsewhere so I'm not going to tell you about flats and all that the main thing is get those images right get those capture those light photons because that's what it's all about so my we'll picture of Andromeda Galaxy have a look at those uh, uh, pictures see what you think and um, like again thanks for watching for my, my guides and um, I hope you have a taste guys and uh, goodbye